my name is Nathan and today we're going to do a comic book story of Noctura, issues number one through six, the first story arc. Brought to you by Rated Comics. This issue is just optioned to be a TV series, so if you want to get the know before the show comes out, you're at the right spot. If this is your first time here, you know what to do. Hit that sub and like button. Also, timestamps will be in the description if you just want to go from one issue to another or vice versa. And if you want to add Noctur to your comic book collection, link in the description if you wish to purchase for Rated Comics. With that being said, let's get to it. We start issue number one in Denver, Colorado, where a question is asked, where were you that morning, the morning the big PM hit? The stories are almost always the same. Driving to work, I was cleaning the dishes and etc. Then suddenly darkness. We see a younger Val Riggs in class. Her call sign is Sundog. And her story that morning of the big PM hit is a little bit different. In short, it took 23 minutes for the sky to go full dark. When it started, she was working on a picture of her adoptive parents, Miguel and Catherine, and her adoptive brother, Imori. We get to know Val a little bit more. She was born legally blind and the condition was correctable, but the orphanage could not afford the surgery. It was total blindness. She could see quick hints of things for a split second before the spots covered them. She came to think of the darkness as dirty fingers blotting out the world. Cruel and greedy. Everything they touched turned other children vicious and mean. She had surgery just before her fifth birthday right after arriving to the States. Beautiful way to intro before we get into the harsh reality. During the PM hit, Val and Imori are looking for their parents. In the car, they know that their parents are scared. Despite them telling them that everything's going to be okay, Miguel asks to turn on the radio. It's clear they don't want to hear on the radio as it stirs up more propaganda and negativity. Be it as it may, they rightfully turned off the radio. Val gets mad at her brother for messing up her picture that she drew of her family. His defense was he wanted to make it more realistic. Typical sibling stuff. She asked again, what do I say when people ask where I was when the big PM hit? I say I was in the backseat of a family car arguing with my brother over a grandson, but that's not where I really was. 13 years later, present time, we are 10 miles out of Lutzville, Colorado Post. Val is driving a tractor trailer. Where's your class A license at, girl? <laughs> Anyways, over the intercom, Val is informed that there's a sizable shades like a hawk and to be careful on her drive. Turns out the person on the intercom is Val's adoptive brother, Imori. She is transporting humans or cargo and she makes an announcement. We've got shades ahead, could be big ones, but I've done this trip over a thousand times and I promise you, you're completely safe in there. Just stay lit and safe. I mean, sit. Naturally, this would make anyone tense and scared, but you have to remain calm. Val gets visual of these shades. So you remind me of those dark figures from that Vin Diesel movie, Pitch Black. M tells Val that something big is circling her. She turns on the heads and this intense amount of light shows the shadows, I mean shades, away so obviously they don't like the light is their weakness. We get a passenger who is having a panic attack. She can't contain herself. She gets up. Some people are trying to get her to calm the F down. She opens the back door and the hand of a shade grabs her face pulls her out. Val knows the back door needs to be closed, so she decides to take matters in her own hands. The door won't close. And then we go back to the narration. Wherever you were on the first day in the big PM, by the second day you were someplace far worse. That's when everything started changing. Val emits this huge blast of light using her flash pop. We also get to know more about the shades. In the big PM hit, any living organisms left unlit in the dark for more than 10 hours start undergoing a biological transformation. Change into what we call a shade. The infection start in the gums, moves into the blood, the bones. If you catch it early, dialysis can sometimes get ahead of it and you won't be turned into a shade. If your gums have gone dark, you may be able to stop the infection with the solar lamp, haloid or xenon, but they're rare as gold. If it gets past your gums though, you're over and done with. Human shades are the apex. They mix with nothing, they live in packs, and they have their own language. They bring down outposts when they feel like it. When you see it, it's already too late. But it's more than human ones, it's everything. Until about 3 years or 3 p.m., you could still tell what an animal was or had been before changing. But now at 13 p.m., 13 years later, it has been where shades, maybe new species, shade plants, have cross-pollinated. It's a whole new ecosystem blooming, growing in us, and we have no place in it. Back in the trailer, the shade is grubbing and Val grabs its attention. Before she could blast it, the shade tackles her like Ray Lewis out of the trailer and onto the streets. 
Amazon intercom says she might be close enough for the spots. Line up now. She asked him, where were you that night? Tell me. I suppose it's code for that she needs to light the flare so they can find her. And there are bigger ones behind that shade that look, that, that look vicious. Val lights up the flare and the outpost lights up the path. She asked him again, where were you? Nowhere, he responds. I was right here, big sister, just like I am now, like always, and I'll always be. I can see this translating very well when it airs on TV. More backstory coming. In the first few weeks the PM hit, the place is a survivor of smaller towns, villages, and neighborhoods that could stay lit in the dark. The rumors about the sanctuary is built by rich bunkers hidden away with solar simulators are BS. Outposts is all they have. This place, the one we see that overlooking, is a hundred years old, manufactured by light bulbs just before the big PM hit. Now it's a hub for ferrymen like her, drivers who haul from outpost to outpost. Val gets her gums checked and she is clear. Val tells this guy that she's off to Tipton shortly as she got to do a pickup. Turns out Tipton went dark yesterday and Val isn't too pleased about the news. Turns out a pack of human shades has something to do with Tipton going dark. She confirms this with Bellwether. To me, Bellwether looks like a sister with attitude, but I'm put in a cool way. Val asks her to tell me something, that there's something left. She wishes she could, and she's asking about Tipton. She asks Val if she wants to cash her credit for the haul. She wants charge, like a charge, like a charger. Hands her the charger, and it's like four hours of charge on it. I'm sure we'll get to know the significance of this later. Bellwether gives Val some news. You've been driving for me since you were a kid, and I'm your friend, right? With the guards, they don't want me to give you any more routes until Imori is clear. It turns out Imori did some things and he has to get checked out. Shortly, a man and his daughter tells Val, AKA Miss Sundog, they like to hire her. She responds with, oh, I only take full trailers, so unless you can pay for a whole trailer, I'm not interested. And they tell her we can't pay in advance, but we can pay when we get there. Val walks away as she wants payment up front or nada. So this man tells Val, we're, where we're going is north of the divide. We need an exceptional driver, and you're that exceptional driver. It's a special place though, a secret place. Do you know what I mean? The little girl props her grandpa to show Val what she's talking about. Sorry, he's talking about. It's a sunburn, but Val is not sure what to believe and is very suspicious about, as there are human shades out there in the north of the divide. She's not convinced that the juice is worth the squeeze. Val walks away and they plead with her again. This time it's a hard pass. Val gets to N's place and tells him to open up. He's in the lab making flash pops with more chromium. As Imori continues to talk about his latest updates to the weapons he's created for fighting the shade, she hits him with something uncomfortable but has to bring it up. She tells him that they're coming to check on you. Bellwether told me he goes silent. Val continues, people saw you sneak out of the post. He gets too defensive to show that he is fine and she wants to check his gums. Eventually he shows her the gums and it's like he knows and, for, and he tells his sister for what it's worth I'm sorry I messed up and I'm really sorry. Bringing levity to the moment she does admit to her brother that those flash pops are pretty damn strong. He smiles back told you. Back to the narrating so where was I really when the big PM hit? I have things went dark for everyone else. I was back in the moment when for everything had first gone bright. Right after my surgery, when they unwrapped my eyes, when Catherine said, welcome to the real world, and I cried in my hospital bed. She cried now because she was happy, but because that bright world, it looked fake, like paper thin fake. I cried because some part of me just knew that the real world was the one back in the dark. Dangerous, vicious, and it was only a matter of time before those long, dirty fingers came to this bright one and pushed through the paper. That's where I was at minute 23 when the sky turned full black. Val is thinking, taking care of her brother, whatever it takes. She gives her some thought. So she goes to the man who approached her earlier about giving him and his granddaughter a lift. He opens the door. Val tells him, if the money isn't there, I will kill you myself. He does understand. He introduces himself as Gustus and his granddaughter is Bailey. Before he could pop the question, Val tells him, we need to leave now get your stuff 680 miles of dark road ahead pretending we're running towards something instead of away that's the mission they got to undertake not to mention with all them shades out there val says all right everyone buckle up stay lit and sit if i only knew what Leia heard how realistic things were about to get i never would have stepped on the gas what a way to foreshadow some things about to happen and that's what val is narrating to herself 
Now, this is what I'm looking forward to to see translated on this TV show. This brother, Blacktop Bill, dings the bell. Bellwether isn't expected. He asked Bellwether for the tags for the driver who just left with the old man and this little girl. I'm not sure who you are, but I don't give out driver tags, Bellwether tells Blacktop Bill. This guy looks vicious. He tells her his call sign, which is Blacktop Bill. We also get a demonstration of what this guy can do. He's all black, not because of a black suit. It's a matrix of carbon nanotubes that bonded to him. If you haven't built up the tolerance for this kind of stuff, it'll burn right through you like hot tar. We get a demonstration, pretty awesome by the way. He lets it be known that he doesn't have a problem with Val, I have a problem with the old man in the truck. He gets the people riled up and it's not what he did to me, it's what he did to all of us. And you see, he's the man who killed the son and we're gonna hunt him down. And we end the story of issue number one, issue number two coming up. In the beginning of this book, Val and Emery have a flashback of before this darkness and the shade and the night monsters and all this shenanigans of darkness just came about. And Emery recalled their parents talking about, you know, 95% of the material in our universe is imperceptible to us. All kinds of magic and energy and is, uh, is undetectable to any of our machines. When the darkness hit, it's like where all the great mysteries lie in a way heaven might be opening itself up and then we show Emery and Val looking for remotes gathering up supplies Emery's like don't even worry about the remotes and the batteries in the remotes are just double-a batteries I mean they're sorry they're just triple-a batteries no they're double A's get your head in the game cut to this <laughs> semi truck running over these monsters and just all hell is breaking loose and they're carporting uh, an old man and a girl and I'm like, okay, this is just like insane. You go from somber, gather materials to boom, here we are, we're just on them run here. And they're going 245 miles in just pitch black darkness. Okay, I, dude, how can you drive in that? Then, then they arrive to Neon Grove. It's like a port where they have to, where all everything's electric, so that's where they have to charge the batteries. There's no gas, you just charge the, the semi truck. When Val, steps off and she has this conversation with the old man. I can't even think of his name right now. He tells her that my brother and I invented this machine that was supposed to see invisible cosmic particles that pass through our universe without interacting uh, anything with light. And these are called Terras. And this machine was supposed to capture particles from the first Terra, but this machine must have found the wrong particle. <laughs> I guess he's explaining how this machine can save the darkness out. Val being a badass chick that she is, She's like, okay, well, this shade senses fear. And she's like, I'm gonna use you as bait. Shade comes out, uses a knife to stab him through the head. And she's like, look, man. She's like, I've seen a whole lot of sunburns over the years, rashes from flowers, good ones, bad ones. And that floor you're holding up, you have to hold that by the base of the stem or your hand will swell up and stink up. You've been out here with us, not in some sanctuary, Lie to a girl about saving the world. Lie to yourself. I don't give a shit. But you know what? You just have my money. I'm like, okay, girl. I mean, okay, girls gotta eat, right? Now, back in the in the car, Val and Emery are talking. She's noticing the infection on her brother's hand is just getting worse, and it's a it's a somber moment there where you know it, it's just you know, man, this girl has it. you got a lot in your plate, girl. And then she gets a a call from Bellwether saying that Blacktop Bill is on the way and you guys gotta move, move, move! And what does he want? Blacktop Bill wants the man and his granddaughter. And it's this amazing, tense standoff of Blacktop Bill and, his, and him arriving where he intercepts uh, Val's helmet and tells, hey, just give me, the, give me the guy, give me the girl, we're good. Well, what do you want to do with them? I want to kill them. Okay, well, you're at least you're blunt. He describes how he's gonna kill that. I mean, it's, it's graphic. I mean, he's gonna kill the girl quickly, but the old man, because he's trouble, he's gonna uh, kill him his favorite way. I'm like, okay, you, I normally leave that up to the imagination of the reader, but no, now you're gonna give me some details? Okay, I'm curious. I'm gonna drag him fast behind my car until his skin scrapes off, then I'm gonna drag him slow. Bruh. Okay. <laughs> and then Val's like, well, you're crazy. And Blacktop Bill's like, I know I am. But if you don't give them to me, I'll lock you in the room with your brother 
and I'm going to tear you to shreds and then I'm going to kill your brother. But if you give them to me, the people I work for, they have some coin. They have this solar lamp that will help heal your brother. Now, Val is in a tough pickle here. Do they have pickles in darkness? Okay. She's in a tough pickle. So she asked the old man, okay, tell me the fuck. Sorry. She asked the old man, tell me the truth. You have to come clean out. He admits that he he, he came clean with the with the machine, it does exist. The reason why, and it's incapable of making a mistake and looked at the center of the universe to find out the light and heaven and instead, this is what has found the worst darkness and there's no way back. And that's when Val knew it was the truth. Why would he lie about this darkness being that there's no way back? And so she started the truck and made her choice. Black tub Bill's like, oh, I do like you. She drops a couple canisters and boom, the chase is on and that's the end of the book right there. We start issue number three with breaking news on TV of the PM outbreak. Flashback, of course. Ank Roman says cellular biologist Dr. Jonas Spinks is going to break down more about the shade infection. The doctor says it's not infection. It's not even a mutation. It's a metamorphosis like I've never seen before. This darkness, it changes the genetic code in all living creatures. But in humans, the changes are far more drastic than in any other species like it does something special to us. This is just the beginning. Whatever the dark is changing us into, we haven't seen the full horror yet. Val and Mori are watching this news coverage as those shades eyes display on TV. And we're reminded by Dr. Jonas Spence, once those eyes change and turn yellow and the pupil distorts, there's no way back. Meaning, you're full on shade. We also get to know more about how the shades communicate. Turns out they have their own way of communicating with each other that we don't understand yet. According to the doctor, shades speak to one another that we can't decipher just yet. Valley and Maury look at each other with the door being knocked on. Whoever's true is behind it trying to open it. I could only imagine who was behind there. Final words from the doctor regarding the shade infections is whoever is infected, do not trust them in what they're saying. By this point, your loved ones is not one of us anymore. He or she is one of them. Their allegiance is to the dark. Turns out it's their parents who are behind the door trying to get out. We're feeling much better, kids, they say. Dad's right. Whatever was making us sick, it's all gone now. Val tells Em to step away from the door and reminds him of what was said on TV. They may be trying to trick us, he said. He refutes the possibility that it could be the opposite. But there's only one way to find out. Imori tells his parents to go to the bottom of the stairs to create some distance and he will open the door. When he opens the door, we see red eyes without the best of intentions from their parents. Despite them saying we love you with all of our hearts, Val narrates that she did believe her adoptive parents about the love part. Well, she didn't realize then was that they weren't talking about to her and her brother. They were talking to something else. Present time, Val is hauling full steam ahead to get away from Blacktop Bill. Blacktop Bill is on their tail in this high speed chase and it's obvious Val can't outspeed him. She braces her passengers for a rough ride and tells them to buckle up. Turns out there is no buckle. Three, two, Val makes an abrupt turn. Blacktop Bill is having fun with all this. I like it. Every second you give me, I'm thinking of funner and funner ways to kill you all. He's gaining on them, but she has something up her sleeve. This huge neon cowgirl light post has something to do with it. What's so special about it? Turns out Bellwether and Fowl set this cowgirl neon light themselves. The cherries on her hip aren't as bright as the other vacuum tubes. That's because they are filled with those close cut with the close cousin of nitroglycerin. That <laughs> chemistry was not my best subject, by the way. CB stands for cherry bump. Other people thought it stood for cowboy. The history behind it hundreds of years ago, most supporters had a couple obstacles set up just beneath the waist to sink intruders or the lock or anyone chasing a local. The neon groove had a few IEDs or a couple deep pits, but the gem is the CB rider. CB, cherry bomb, booby traps if needed to be used. Despite the theatrical explosion that would have kept them at bay, he is still behind them and pursuing hotter than ever. Val decides to chop the castellation. Star is sharp enough to take out his tires. As Val narrates, his reputation precedes him. Obviously, this doesn't, this doesn't phase him and he finds it annoying, but cute. So he one-ups her and harpoons his weapon onto her truck. 
and he toys with her a little bit. I'll tell you a secret, Val. Sometimes I'd wound my prey just to stalk it a little to see it struggle. In other words, he's draining the power from her truck just to see her struggle before he does his final act. We can only imagine what that is. In the trailer, Gus gives the book to Bailey to give to his brother. If he's still alive, he tells her it won't make sense to you guys. And it won't make sense to you, but it'll make sense to his brother. He admits to lying to her about bringing back the son. There is no way to go back, but there might be a way to get through this. His final words to Bailey, tell my brother the char they chart the path to the garden of Eos. I love you. He opens the back door and tells Bill to come on and get him and shoots at his ride. The shooting does little to nothing to his ride, of course. He shoots and impales Gus. Gus is pulled out and he tells Bailey to close the door. This brother, Blacktop Bill, seems to enjoy playing with his food just a little bit. He says if I was being lazy, I'll just go straight for the head. We see a bullet go straight through Val's clothing. Imori tells Val that the battery is nearly sapped, but we're okay. Gus snapped off the harpoon. He's told to drop everything. Slight reluctance, he does it to ensure they won't be followed. Blacktop Bill stops and approaches Gus. Well, well, well. How often does a guy get to speak with one of his makers? Though I did hear you vote against me being the final choice for this position, he said he worried I might enjoy the job a little too much. Gus please and tells him that he gave the girl a fake version of my journal. Here's the real one, so there's no need to go after them. Kill me, not them, let them go. Like he said, this guy enjoys his job a little too much. I'm not going to kill either of you, Doc. I'm going to keep you in harpoon until you turn yourself into a shade. Not turn yourself into a shade, until he turns into a shade. Then you're going to kill the girl yourself. No, please, he begs. Here's to always enjoying a job a little too much, as he tosses a book like it's garbage. Val says she drives another 100 miles on the back roads to get clear of back blacktop bill. By now, they're in the hills outside of the Fallen Post Tipton, what used to be called Utah. They're holed up in a spot at the foot of the mountain, an old cavern that was a tourist attraction back in the day because of the ancient cave paintings inside. These things were mixed with these words. I'm not even gonna try to pronounce what makes them glow. Chemistry and this type of stuff is not my strongest subject. Fairy men make their own handprints on the wall with whatever it glows, it's called the Cave of Palms. All Val cared about was they're safe for now. Call back to issue number one. Imori tells Val the real reason why he snuck out. To her, it's not important anymore. It doesn't matter. He still wants it to be known that he was trying to do something good. Character building moment. Bailey asks Val if the handprints are fake or real. She responds with, it doesn't matter. She apologizes as to what happened to her grandfather and Bailey lets Val in on the truth. I only met him a month ago. The outpost we lived at, me and my parents, it was taken down by human shades. I ended up in the woods hiding. I was down to the lighting shade, word on fire, but it burned so dark and it's barely a glow. Grandpa got showed up just as it fell apart. I only knew him for pictures. He told me about bringing back the light and the secret place. Val asked to know everything about the sanctuary. Bailey said it has everything we need, meaning sunlight. Even stronger than the real thing he called the Lux. Val asked for real things, not BS answers, because she's not buying it at all. Bailey hands Val the book and said we're supposed to give it to his brother Tiberius since he'll know what to do. Val looks through the book and it doesn't even make any sense. It's just a bunch of gibberish writing. None of it makes any sense. Bailey adds that's what my grandpa Gus said. It wasn't going to make sense to us. Bailey asks Val why did she take the job? Why did she agree to haul them? Because the truth is she has no other options, she answered. She makes it clear she's not in this for some fantasy thing about saving the world. She's in them, She's in this to survive. This is the world. Daylight is gone forever. Bailey adds, she's never seen daylight and she was born in the big PM. But she believes in it coming back and coming back better like my grandfather said. I believe in this book and just to piss you off, I've decided to believe in the hands on the wall too that they're the real deal. Deal with it. Val narrates that her never having seen the sun got her a little bit. When she turned back to M, he was busy whispering in prayers, words of love. He's struggling and fighting the urge inside of him. Sad to say the unfortunate is happening. He's churning into a shade. But just like the parents in the beginning of this issue, when Val told Imora that she loved him, he said, I love you too. It was at that point she knew he was speaking to something else. 
And that's how issue number two concludes. All I got to say is I have the perfect lead actress to play Val after reading this. And this is her picture right here. Haley Steinfeld. Comment below. Let me know what your thoughts are. Let's go on to issue number three. In the beginning, we start off with the flashback where people realize the key to survive the dark was staying lit, the light. On the fourth day, federal refugees set up malls, stadiums with heavy duty lights, staffed with doctors and soldiers. Valentine is packing supplies and she tells M to look for dad's gun and bang, bang, there's a knock on the door with language that they don't understand. It's their mother and father. Valentine tells M that whatever mom and dad are turning into down there, they're getting stronger and they're gonna break through that door any second now. M is holding dad's gun but not wanting to give it up and tears in his eyes tells Valentine that we always do things your way and the bang in the crack on the door gets louder and stronger. He tells Valentine the soldiers will come and they'll have lights that will make it safe that'll maybe help mom and dad this time we're doing it my way. Valentine reflects on that moment over and over and, and the choice she made. She also imagines M does too while we go into the present time. While he's lying down with the sickness, fighting off the sickness while the shade is taking over, Val only hopes that the solar lamp is at the destination where they're driving to. They arrived at Tipton, the town called Tipton, and Val reflects what she did in that moment way back then on the last day before people start thinking in days and nights. There's a suitcase on top of the building which Valentine explains it where airlines sent all their unclaimed luggage. Thousands of suitcases a week. That building used to be a suitcase museum. Tipton was a major trading hub until the shades dragged everyone out. Out of nowhere, a shade tries to do a surprise attack on Valentina and Bailey. Val handles that like a boss and figures are others so they need to move fast. Inside the building, it got shade fish, and I could tell you right now with the looks of those shade fish, I could tell you exactly what I'm not having for dinner. Nasty. Another shade attack on the two lovely ladies, but this time it's M. Whoa, man, this is heavy. This seriously needs to be made into like a Netflix series or something. Just thought I expressed an opinion that no one asked for. Val shines light on M and he kind of reverts back while he's fighting it off he says he's trying to suppress it but there's a voice in his head and it seems like he can't control himself so he's telling val to stay away from him to protect you guys we all know that ain't gonna happen val is just not that kind of girl she tells him to block that voice out a little longer and keep the bad door locked i guess that's referencing the beginning of the book at the charge station val says the harpoon that blacktop bill hit him with was a aged the battery 10 year by 10 years in the truck that they're driving only has enough charge to go to the sanctuary. Bailey feels that Val wants to turn the truck around and through this back and forth dialogue, it was a powerful one when they both agreed to go to the sanctuary together. Blacktop Bill is in hot pursuit of the girls and what he did with the scientists from issue number three, now, Bailey's grandfather, is, let's just say it's enough for him to yell for Blacktop Bill to end his life. This guy is no joke. When they get to the section, the rig like dims out and runs out of charge, but they're a couple hundred meters ahead and they're forced to walk the remaining way. Oh man, the suspense is seriously, this needs to be made into a Netflix series or something. As they walk, something's wrong and they question this is the place. Meanwhile, there's some wrestling nearby. It's an all out attack and Val tells Bay to get behind her as she handles this like a boss. Val tells Bailey to stay with her. Bailey notices the shades are retreating. There's only one reason why shades retreat from the prey. It's because human shades are in the scene. Val reflects in that moment way back in the house with Emery when he wants to wait for the door to open and she wants to run. I got to leave some meat on the bone with this, but this book ends off with a cliffhanger and just, this has to become a Netflix series or Amazon Prime or something. We start off with this book where we ended up with issue number four where M, Val, and Bailey were seeking refuge and they got refuge and Val is just like, wow, I wasn't ready to believe that this place was what we found was for real. And then we see Tiberius say, hurry up, every second counts. We see M speaking in this sh shade language that they can't decipher. Before Val can argue with Tiberius about where they're going, where we, what are we doing? Tiberius opens a door and now they go into this room where there's just beaming light and it's beautiful. And Tiberius tells Val, get M into the cradle because that beam of light is supposed to heal him. The light, it's a special light. It's called, and without interruption, it says the Lux or Lux. M turning into full on shade, attacking, and these soldiers hit M and Val at the same time with these tranquilizers and 
Boom, and M talks about how she had her regrets. I'll let you guys get the book to read about that. But while in unconscious, the tranks knock her out for a full day, nearly 24 hours. But she stopped because she had no idea what the last word of her sentence should be. She wanted to ask if M was okay, but wasn't sure if she was gonna complete that sentence with dead, a shade, a better. But Bailey gives her a glimmer of hope and says, hey, why don't you come see for yourself? And M woke up and did. And when she did, it looks like M is almost all the way recovered. And a nurse says it's amazing, the Lux is strong. But no one has ever came as far as your brother because he was pretty far gone, man. Your brother's a real fighter. Nurse offers Val to get under the, the light so she can heal from her wounds. And Val's like, nah, I'm, I'm cool. But Bailey was talking about while M was in, you know, unconscious or whatnot, or healing. He kept saying something about stills. What's the stills about? And Val tells him, st staying still. He was hard for M to stay still as a kid. He likes to toss and turn. So still is his call sign. Bailey tells Val that Tiberius would like to see her. So she goes see Tiberius and, you know, Tiberius greets her and tells her, and we get into a deep knowledge of Tiberius, who his brother is, how they had a rival, how when their parents died, his brother viewed him just for like a money machine, nothing more. They're always in competition. And Val is not sure whether she should stay or not. She hasn't made a decision. Should she stay or should they go on the run? But Tiberius wants to be up front with her and says, well, before you answer that, I gotta show you something. And what he shows her is these smudges, these human shades, and these human shades are the alpha shades. And Tiberius says we call them homo nocturus, the apex. It's hard seeing them up close, but there are people that we once knew. We kept them here to study them, to figure more about their language and plans. And someday I wish we could just burn them, but we have to keep them for our research. More dialogue is Susan Val tells Tiberius that his brother gave her a journal. And this journal we're talking about the writings that could be used to bring up the light the god of light that you're talking about the earth and mention something they call the eos but tiberius plays it off with i'm sorry but i'm not interested whether or not my brother's original intentions were altruistic or selfish i just don't care i don't want it but tiberius ends it with i like i said you're welcome to stay but if you do this is what you get no more no less so he was very frank and upfront with her so she thought it over for three days and i think she made her decision at this point Murray tells us how that her call sign is Piper. And I'll let you guys read what Pi what the meaning of Piper is. We get a nurse, tells Val it's Emery. He's fully recovered. And they have this hugging moment, break it up, you know, tears down the eyes. And M, t but M tells Val that he had these images. And his images were Val, you were speaking their language. You were talking to them the way that mom and dad were back then. And it was talking about the shade. They talk like it's in images or impressions. The darkness connects them somehow and they communicate through it. I could feel it. And this war is just the beginning. I could feel their fears. And they were these beings made of light or something called Eos. They're enemies. I don't know. I could just see it all. And Val's like, hey, take it easy. You just need to rest some more. And then Val tells M, hey, the good news is, you know, we're just going to stay. But M tells Val, like, hey, you made me made a stimulator. And I told you I lost track, but I didn't really lose track. I was just working to try to fix it because I want to fight this. And then Val's like, she thinks about it. And she tells him, what, so you just let yourself get infected? I'm not saying that. I'm just, I'm a survivor. I want to survive. I don't want to be on the run. Val wants to stay in, in the refuge so she doesn't have to be on the run. M wants to fight this. And Val confronts like, I've done everything to protect you. You're ungrateful. And this dialogue gets intense. So after she tosses and turns, Bailey comes in there and tells Val, why is the significance of Piper for her call sign? Val wakes up, walks to Tiberius's office, and I'm gonna leave this ending with the ultimate cliffhanger because at this point we did not know or see where Blacktop Bill was at. I'm like, dude, the guy is a gangster. Where is he at? But now we get to see who he's working for, who his employer employer is. I thought he was just a rogue mofo gone the loose. Nah, the, someone is right in the check and there's a bigger meaning behind it. And this is where I'm gonna end issue number five at. Hi, my name is Nathan. Today, we're going to do a comic book review of Noctera, issue number six, brought to you by Rated Comics. Let's get to it. In this issue, we begin with Val asking the question, where were you on the morning of the big PM hit once everything went dark? Once the human shades 
got into the crowd of people, it was absolute carnage. I love the description of the shades that their skin had some kind of sharpness to it, like it was made of thousands of tiny blades or shards of black grass. What a way to paint a visual and feel for these things as they slice away through the crowd of people with the hush sound. The sound Val remembers when the parent tells their children to be quiet. Hush! These shades got to work with purpose as if they were designed to take out crowds of people with this kind of ease. What a vision right there. Fast forward to present time, Val is in the room where, where Tiberius and Blacktop Bill are conversing, not knowing that Val is listening off visual. Blacktop Bill demands that Tiberius lets him in to kill Val so he can complete the job Tiberius hired him for. Tiberius is not ready for that as he wants to see what Val knows and he wants to look at the book they have from Tiberius' brother Gus. That was before Blacktop Bill turned Gus into a shade so that he, meaning Gus, can kill his own granddaughter. So much betrayal here. When Tiberius disagrees with Blacktop Bill's method by telling that your job is to eliminate people and not to have fun with your methods you, that you're doing it, Val lets her presence be known by saying, I couldn't agree more. That's a gangster entrance. Before she can pull that trigger, she gets outgunned and is asked to drop the weapon. Tiberius tells Val, we don't sneak up on people around here. Val's intentions were to leave and she was going to tell him that before, you know, the bad timing thing, walking in on them and all that kind of stuff happened. Tiberius tells her that her and her convoy won't be going anywhere. He tries to strike a deal with Val and Marie and Gus's granddaughter, Bailey, or in this case, his niece. All this betrayal, especially his niece, when Tiberius openly admits to backstabbing his own brother. Long story short, they didn't want Gus to end the PM slash darkness. Tiberius and company wanted to control the shades via by controlling the light and be God, so to speak. You gotta check out the book for this. Tiberius asked Bailey for his brother's research as he brought to the people's attention as, as an investment. Blacktop Bill is part of the deal and now he needs Gus's research and tells Bailey that if she doesn't give it up, or if she gives it up, perhaps he will let them stay and not be harmed. Val isn't feeling any of it and tells ba Bailey, let them tear this place apart looking for it. Bailey tells her uncle that the journal is under the bed that they healed Emery, you know, the cradle. Well, his, her uncle goes to make sure Bailey gets telling the truth and instructs the guards to keep an eye on them. The guards tell them not to do anything foolish, but Emery's response is, foolish is kind of our thing. Fizzle, he admits power, and now it's a party, y'all. They need a plan to get out, and two guns from the guard will not be enough firepower. Emery and Bailey tell Val that they need to have the sizzlers and flash pops. Val knows it won't be enough and tells him she knows exactly what we need to do to get up out of here. But they're not going to like it. Tiberius finds his brother's research book right away where Bailey said it would be, under the cradle. In this part right here, Tiberius tells Blacktop Bill that he was listening to Emery babble as he went shade. He explains as Emery went shade, the tongue learned an exponential amount about their morphology and they can study it. This intrigues the heck out of Blacktop Bill. Even though Bill, Blacktop Bill is instructed to kill Val, Emery, and his niece Bailey, Tiberius said he'll let Bill listen to the tape. Just go kill him. I love Blacktop Bill's response and he ends with, do you want them killed fast or slowly? To me, I believe this is showing seeds for more future not terror stories. When Bill approached him, he thinks they're huddling up and awaiting their death from him. It turns out Emery is using those flash chops with more chromium. Blacktail Bill was not expecting this. Emery pushes the button and frees these caged up shades and these shades are ready to beast. I love when stories tie things into the intro and Val describes the hush sound from the flashback in the beginning of this issue. What a beautiful mess. Bloody massacre as they make their escape up out of there. I'm going to leave a little meat on the bone with this review just in case you guys decide to purchase the comic. Link in description by the way. What I do love in this series is Val is the character who has undergone serious change in a good way and great character development on her part. When the series launched, she was fairly cynical and thought the world was at an end. Now with proof that there is light beyond the seemingly end of the shadows, she's gained a bit more faith. I got to give the writing credit where credit is due because good writers are able to develop their characters through time. Val's shift in perspective is a clear example of how to do it the right way. I love that underlying message about faith, believing what you can't see despite how dark it, if things appear to be. Not sure if there was pun intended in that or not, Nocturne number six marks the end of this issues or this series first story arc and I love how it perfectly mixes horror and hope in my opinion. I look forward to future projects of this series 
and this has the potential of a Netflix or Amazon Prime show in the making, and I hope they are listening. With that being said, if you like the content we're throwing up, and you would like more comic book reviews, comic book related content with the occasional comic book giveaway, don't be stingy and show rated comics some love. Thanks again for watching, until next time.